as we walk through life, um, we all have to make choices, don't we? Lots of choices. Lots and lots and lots and lots of choices. And one of the first things I think we all learn about making choices is this. Every choice comes with a consequence. And there are good consequences and there are bad consequences and there are big consequences and there are little consequences. But every choice we make has tied to it and associated with it an inseparable consequence. Think about all the choices you make. Some of them are real little choices, like, what am I going to wear today? How many of you woke up this morning and said, what am I going to wear today? Anybody? That was a choice. How am I going to fix my hair today? I didn't have to worry a lot about that. But some of y'all had to make that choice. What am I going to eat today? What am I going to buy at the grocery store today? What am I going to say when I run into this person at work today or tomorrow? Which parking spot am I going to pick? The one close to the cart return or the one a little further away? Where am I going to fill my truck or car or minivan up with gas? We make all kinds of choices like that. And then we also make some really big choices in life too, right? Like, who, who am I going to marry? What career path am I going to take? How much debt am I, am, am I willing to take on and choose to incur for me and my, my family? Should I move across the state or across the country for this new opportunity or not? See, in general, and I think you guys will agree with me on this, but, but in general... The bigger the choice, the bigger the consequence. Some of our choices don't have real big consequences. Our little choices don't have big consequences. Like, what am I going to wear today? Well, if you make the wrong choice, I mean, what's going to really happen? Maybe you show up and and you walk into the business meeting that you weren't expecting to be in that day and you're a little embarrassed because you're underdressed. Or, Or maybe you're a little bit too hot. Or maybe in here this morning you're a little bit too cold. Because you didn't wear the right thing. But in the grand scheme of life, we all know that's a a little small consequence. But if you make the wrong choice in the spouse you choose to marry, that can affect you for the rest of your life. If you make the the wrong choice about a career decision or a job, that, that can affect you and your family for decades. See, every choice has a consequence. That's our big idea for today. It's the thing I want you to understand, that every choice you make has a consequence. And today, we're going to talk about the biggest choice everybody has to make, the granddaddy of them all, the biggest choice you will ever have to make in your life. And that biggest choice comes with the biggest consequence as well. Let me ask you this. By show of hands, Have you ever done something that seemed right at the time? You thought you were doing the right thing, but it turned out to be totally wrong. Anybody else? Okay, good. Now, I'm not doing that to embarrass you. I'm not doing that to point you out. I'm doing it to illustrate the fact that we've all been there. We are all in that situation at some point in our life. We thought we were making the right choice, but then later in hindsight, we discovered It was a bad choice. And if you've ever been there, you're not alone. Not only have we all been there, um, the Bible is full of people who've been there. I want you to hear this if you just raised your hand. Making a bad choice does not make you bad. It also does not make you less important or less valuable or less significant or less usable by God. The Bible is full of people who made bad choices. Some of them made uh, little choices that were bad, and some of them made really big choices that were bad. And every one of their choices, just like every one of yours, came with a consequence or consequences. I think of people like Abraham, Isaac, Moses, David, Jonah, every single one of the apostles. The apostle Paul made some really poor choices. And just like you and just like me, 
they all learn that every choice they make has a consequence. So today, as we're focusing on this most important choice that you will ever have to make in your life, I want you to know right from the beginning that it's also going to carry the greatest consequence for your life. Not only here and now, but also there and then as you transition into eternity. This is the choice between life and death. And the consequence is life or death. Look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. We've been spending our time launching off, at least in this series called The Path, in the book of Proverbs. And today we begin here where it says this, There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. There is a way that makes sense and seems right, but in the end turns out to be the wrong choice and produces the wrong consequences. We've all been there. Solomon knew that we as humans frequently choose the path that seems right to us, but in the end leads to death or some kind of consequence that we are not going to enjoy. Jesus actually addresses this very same thing, and he, he hits it head on in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's what we're really going to camp out and stick with today because I think he makes it so clear in Matthew chapter 7. Here Jesus is starting to wind down and wrap up the Sermon on the Mount. And we find this very, very important, extremely significant text about choices and consequences. It says this in Matthew seven thirteen. This is Jesus. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. And then he says in verse 14, how narrow is the gate and how difficult is the road that leads to life. And few find it. Here in this text, all of humanity is presented with a choice. And all of humanity is confronted with the consequences of their choice. Here in this text, we see two gates presented. It's point number one, if you're following along in your outlines, two gates. And I want you to notice, and I want to be clear, there are only two gates. Two gates for all of humanity. Not three, not four, not five, not a hundred, certainly not a thousand or a million. There are two gates, only two. There's a narrow gate and there's a wide gate. Everybody in this room, everybody right now watching online, everybody right now listening on the radio, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone on this planet will walk through one of those two gates. And there's a choice to be made and there's a consequence to be had. Enter through the narrow gate, he says, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who go through it. The word here for enter is significant. Not so much the word, but the way it's framed in the Greek. It's in the the aorist imperative tense and You don't need to know what that means, and you certainly don't need to write it down or remember it, but you do need to know the implication behind that. You see, that word is is put in that tense because it demands a specific action. Jesus is commanding you, and he's commanding me, and he's commanding everyone who can hear me and everyone who can see me. He's commanding all of humanity to do something very specific, to act and do something very specific. Here he's saying, enter through the narrow gate. As the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, he's demanding that we enter through this gate because he knows of the two choices you have and the two gates there are to choose from, this is the better option. You see, we're not just supposed to look at the gate. You're not just supposed to know where the gate is. We're being commanded to enter through the narrow gate. 
Because that's the gate that leads to heaven. And the other leads to hell. You see, every choice has a consequence. And this is the granddaddy of them all. And you may say, well, I don't know, preacher, that sounds pretty narrow-minded. There got to be more than two choices. There have to be more than two gates, but there, there's not. And this has always been the case. We've always had to make a choice between God and the culture, God and the world, doing it God's way or doing it another way. We can go all the way back into the Old Testament and we can see it. We, we even see it in our verse from Proverbs this morning, Proverbs 16, 25. There's a way that seems right to a person, a way that would seem right to the world, a, a way that would make sense. But in the end, many times that way, that broad way, that, that, that big way, that big gate, it leads to death. We can go back to Deuteronomy where it says this in chapter 30, verses 19 through 20. It says, I call on heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, a choice. Two choices, not four, not five, not a hundred. Two. Life and death. Blessing and curse. And he says here in Deuteronomy, choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Love the Lord your God, obey him, and remain faithful to him, for he is your life, and he will prolong your days as you live in the land the Lord, the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can go to Joshua chapter 24, verses 13 through 15, where it says this, I gave you a land you did not labor for, and cities you did not build, though you live in them. You're eating from vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. I've been good to you, he says, right? And then he says, therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods of your ancestors' worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and worship the Lord. Stop worshiping the people your ancestors worshiped in Egypt and worship me. I've been good to you, God says. But then he says in verse 15, but if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose, make a choice for yourselves today. Which will you worship? The gods of your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living? And then he says, as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. I've made my choice. But there's only two choices. You can either worship God or you can worship not God's. Two gates, two possibilities. First Kings chapter 18, 21. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. They didn't want to make a choice, but in the end they had to because there's only two choices. Jeremiah 21, 8. But tell this people, this is what the Lord says. Look, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Two choices. There's always only been two choices. Jesus here just puts it in the form of gates. A narrow one and a wide one. But there's still only two. And following God has never, ever, ever been the easy choice. But you know what? It's always been the right choice. And unfortunately, time and time and time and time and time and time and time again, most of us make the wrong choice. There are a few things you should know about the narrow gate. Really, both of the gates. The first one is this. You should know that you enter this gate alone. It's not big enough to go through with other people. This isn't a gate you walk through with your church. It's not a gate I can hold your hand and walk you and lead you through. It's not a gate you can walk through with your family. It's, it's not a gate you get to walk through with your spouse. You can't drag anybody through this gate. It's not wide enough. It's not big enough. And nobody can drag you through it either. The gate is so narrow, only you will fit. Some commentators have described it as a 
turnstile. You know, a turnstile, like when you're going into a subway or you're going into a sporting event or you're going into a rodeo, going into a theme park, it's just big enough for you. Can't take two people through it. That's kind of how this gate is. It's so narrow, only you can make the choice to walk through it. There's only room for one. Second thing you ought to know about this gate is you can enter through this gate, this narrow gate. You enter it with absolutely nothing. It's so narrow you can't take anything with you. Not only can you not take anyone with you, you can't take anything with you. You can't take your money with you. The gate's too narrow. There's not even enough room in this gate for you to bring your debit card. (laughs) You can't bring it. It won't fit in the gate. There's, there's no room in this gate for your preferences or for your opinions. There's no room in this narrow gate for your diplomas or your certificates or your accomplishments or your titles. There, there's no room in this gate for your trophies or your treasures. There's no room in this gate for your attitude. Even the most humble among us will be forced to leave whatever little attitude they still have left in their flesh outside of this gate. It won't fit. You see, we're called when we come to Christ to abandon everything and follow him to the very point of denying ourselves and picking up a cross. Matthew 16, 24 through 25, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross And follow me. He says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. I love the way one commentator put it. He said, salvation is the exchange of all that we are for all that he is. In other words, you leave all of you behind and you embrace all of him. You see, there's there's really only one good option. And one good choice, because the other option, the other choice, isn't a very good one. For those who don't want to enter through the narrow gate, Jesus says, well, there's another option. It's a wide gate. And this gate is an easy gate. This gate is a comfortable gate. This gate won't cost you very much to go through it. At least not now. But later, it'll cost you your life, because that gate only leads to death. It will always, through man's eyes, look like the better choice. Remember, there's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, that way leads to death. That's this wide gate. It seems right, it looks right, it looks better, but in the end, it leads to death. And every choice carries a consequence, and there's two gates and two different destinations and two different consequences that go with each gate. It's not just two gates, there's two ways mentioned in this text. That's point number two, two ways. These two ways lead to two very different destinations. The narrow gate leads to a narrow way, and the wide gate leads to a wide way or a broad way. And each gate has its own list of characteristics. We won't spend a long time talking about them, but it is worth mentioning One commentator offered a very thorough list of characteristics of the broad and wide way. The path that the wide gate leads to. We'll deal with it first. He said that wide gate leads to a wide path or a wide way that would be defined with these kind of characteristics. Easy, attractive, inclusive, indulgent, permissive. Self-oriented, in other words, it's all about you. That wide way has very few rules, very few restrictions, very few requirements. Sin is tolerated on that wide way. Truth is moderated on the wide way. No spiritual maturity is needed for the wide way. No moral character is needed either. No commitment is needed on the wide way. No sacrifice is needed on the wide way. It's why it seems like the right way for men just looking at it in their flesh. It's not hard to understand why so many would choose the wide gate and the wide way. 
It's not hard to understand why so many get sucked into that tragic path. But then on the other hand, there's a narrow way. And the Greek word here, again, is very important. It actually comes from the root of the word that means to groan, to agonize. You see, this isn't just a narrow way, it's a hard way. This is why nobody's just going to wander into heaven all by accident. Like, oh, how'd I end up here? Whoo, whoo, got lucky. You're not going to just wander into heaven. You're not going to stumble into it. Just like nobody wanders to the summit of Mount Everest. Just like nobody just one day goes, whoa, look at me. I'm on top of the world. What of you? No, the way to get to the top of Mount Everest requires purpose. It requires planning. It requires effort. It requires much pain and suffering and groaning to get there. You don't just end up there. It's the same with heaven. And a lot of people don't think that. A lot of people think they're just going to end up there. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, no, no, no. See, I'm giving you a choice between these two gates and these two ways. And you've got to make a choice. And then you've got to accept the consequence of your choice. And I know some of y'all, you know, are going to say, well, what about the thief on the cross? Yeah, man, what a story. But even the thief on the cross had to repent of his sins had to confess Jesus as his Lord and Savior, had to submit the rest of his life, though a very short period, to the ways of the king and the glory of the kingdom. Even he had to leave himself behind and embrace for a very short amount of time the ways of the kingdom and the rules of the king. He gave it all up. And that's why Jesus said, yeah, today you'll be with me in paradise. Don't think he got off easy. He died on a cross too. He found Jesus on a cross. Someone much smarter than me wrote this about this verse. He said, God's way of salvation is remarkably simple, but it's not easy. We can give nothing or give nothing up that will earn us entrance into the kingdom. But if we long to hold on to forbidden things, it can indeed keep us out of the kingdom. That's another reason why few are those who find it. We can pay nothing for salvation, yet coming to Jesus Christ costs us everything we have. Indeed, this is the most important choice you will ever make. Which gate are you going to choose? The one that will cost you everything, but also gain you everything? Or the one that will cost you nothing, but in the end, cost you everything? Because these two gates lead to two very different ways, and ultimately, two very different destinations. That's number three. Two destinations are in this text. This isn't complicated or confusing. It's not cryptic. It's not complex. Jesus makes it extremely simple. Listen to it again. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. That's one destination. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life? That's the second destination. And few find it. Only two gates, only two ways or two roads, and only two possible destinations. The wide gate and the wide road lead to destruction. The narrow gate and the narrow road lead to life. Wouldn't it be nice if it was the other way around? Have you ever thought that? I think that a lot about things in life. Like, wouldn't it be nice if it was the other way around? Like, I'll give you an example. Wouldn't it be nice if ice cream made you skinny? Wouldn't that be nice if it was the other way around? Or wouldn't it be nice if watching TV made you smart? Like, wouldn't that be really nice if you could just sit around and be that vegetable on the couch and just watch TV all the time and then just get really smart? If it was the other way around? Wouldn't it be nice if taking long walks on the beach would make you rich? 
Like, wouldn't that be great if you could just get up every morning and then every night at sunset just go for a long walk on the beach and just get rich from doing that? Wouldn't it be nice if going out to eat for every meal made you healthy? Wouldn't it be good if it was the other way around? You know what I'm saying? Like, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But we all know none of that's going to happen. We all know that every choice has a consequence. And here we're talking about the choice of all choices, the choice of destruction. Many commentators equate this as Jesus making an indirect reference to hell. In the context of the passage, it's not hard to see that that there's a very real possibility of that. He's pointing to that as the end. We know that's the end from the context of Scripture. But John MacArthur made a really, really... Um, interesting observation in his commentary on this text. One that I had never considered or never thought of, and and I I thought it was great. I wanted to present it to you today. These are his words. He says, Both the broad and the narrow ways point to the good life, to salvation, to heaven, to God, to the kingdom, and blessing. But only the narrow way actually leads to those. There's nothing here to indicate that the broad way is marked hell. And there isn't in the the actual Greek. But he says the point our Lord is making is that it's marked heaven, but does not lead there. That's the great lie of all the false religions of human achievement. And it's very true, isn't it? That's why so many ultimately choose that wide gate and that wide path because it looks so good. It looks like heaven. It looks like heaven. It's appealing. It's enticing. It's, it's sweet and it's savory and it's, it's easy and it's tolerant. It's politically correct. It doesn't cost you anything. It looks so, so Good to just walk through that gate and walk down that path, that way, your entire life. But the issue is, it's false advertisement at its worst. The devil says, heaven is this way. Go through the big gate. Go on the wide road, the easy one. The one everybody else is going down. Go down that one. It's going to lead you to a real good place. It's the easiest way to get there. But in the end, you know where that one goes? To death. This isn't a perfect example, but it's the only one I could come up with. I'm a very imperfect person and preacher, so I'll give it to you. It's why you never see fat people on TV eating ice cream and pizza in the commercials. (laughs) Have y'all ever noticed when you see like a pizza commercial or an ice cream commercial, it's always real skinny people, pretty people. I mean, these are the people that eat it for the commercial and then go throw it up in the bathroom probably. Like, you you look, like, if you just look at it, uh, there's only 30 seconds, so you don't really have time to process it. But next time you see one of these commercials, just consider what I'm telling you. Look at it and go, do you really think that person is eating ice cream and pizza? Very often, no. They're not. Right, But why do they want you to see that on TV? Because when you see that, you go, heaven, woo, I can eat ice cream and pizza and look like that. No, you can't. When you eat ice cream and pizza, you look like this. (laughs) It's false advertisement. There's a stretch of road in Wyoming. Heather, Heather, our ministry assistant, brought this up this week. Great illustration. Stretch a road in Wyoming called the Highway to Heaven. We have a picture of it, throw up on the screen. And it looks like you're driving right into eternity. You know what the problem is? You know where it goes? To a valley. It doesn't go to heaven at all. It goes to another valley. You see, what, what you're looking at can look so good, but it can actually take you to a place that doesn't look like it's taking you to. I think John MacArthur is right. When he says both of these gates are marked heaven, both of these roads are marked heaven, the actual issue is only one leads to heaven. 
And that's why Jesus is so clear in saying, hey, you've got to enter through the narrow gate. It's why he doesn't leave any room for doubt. It's why he doesn't say you can just pick whatever gate you want. They're both going to bring you to the same place. No, he's saying there's two gates, there's two roads, and there's two destinations. And I'm just going to tell you the answer to the one you need to go through and actually command you to go through it. The only path that leads to God, the only path that leads to peace, the only path that leads to life, the only path that leads to glory is the narrow gate and the narrow road. The psalmist in Psalm 17, 15 said, But I will see your face in righteousness when I awake. I will be satisfied with your presence. You don't know how much I wish that was really true for everybody. I wish that was true. I wish that everyone would be able to embrace God or be embraced by him one day. And I also wish that eating ice cream made me skinny. But you know what? Neither one of those two things are going to happen. Because many, many people choose the wide gate and the wide road that leads to the destination we know as death. Every choice, church, has a consequence. And so you might choose that wide gate and that wide way and that wide road, and you're not going to like the destination it goes to. There's one final thing we see here in our text. Two groups. In our text, Jesus describes the two groups. They are described as the many and the few. Enter through the narrow gate, he says, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And here's group number one. There are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And here's group number two. Few find it. There's only two groups. The many who go through the wide gate and the few who go through the narrow one. On that road of the many and that wide gate of the many, you're going to find a lot of people. That's what the word many means. On that road will be atheists and agnostics, humanists and theists, Jews and Gentiles, men and women, rich and poor, every race, every age, every background, every creed you can imagine. On that road will be Mormons, Catholics, Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and many, many, many more. Because on that road, you will find the many unrepentant people who rejected Jesus all of their lives, directly or indirectly. On that road, there will be many unrepentant church people who spent most of their lives sitting in church on Sunday mornings too. The many will include anyone who made the choice of the wide gate and the wide road that the world insisted was a good one and was going to lead you to heaven instead of the narrow gate and the narrow road that the Lord commanded you to enter through. Then there are the few, second group. And some would tell you that there's only a few because the gate is too narrow, the gate is too small. But that's not the case. Even this extremely narrow, small gate is eternally equipped and eternally adequate to handle the whole of humanity should they choose to enter through it. It's not that the gate is too small. It's that you're not making the choice to go through it. See, there are a few, not because the gate is too small, but because only a few choose the gate. God wants all of humanity to go through this narrow gate. Peter in 2 Peter said this, 3 verse 9, The Lord does not delay in his promise, as some some understand delay, but he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God wants everybody to go through that gate, and that gate is big enough for everybody to go through it. In John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40, Jesus said, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. 
For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Can I just summarize that very, very quickly and succinctly for you? Anyone who will come to Jesus can come to Jesus. There's a choice. A narrow gate, a narrow road that leads you to a destination with a very few people as your group or a wide gate and a wide road with many people going to a very different destination. But anyone who will come, anyone who will confess, anyone who will repent can come to Jesus and can enter through the narrow gate. The gate is not the restriction, it's the choice. I'm frequently misunderstood and misquoted and misinterpreted by other people. And hey, if I'm being honest, it's probably just my fault. (laughs) It's probably due to my poor choice of words or my inadequate communication skills. And I'll be honest with you, church, I sincerely apologize for those shortcomings in my life. And I thank you and I am grateful that you continue to show up despite me every Sunday. Okay? But if you would allow me, I just want to, I want to close today and I want to just in an effort, I want to be abundantly clear because this is the choice of all choices and it's the consequence of all consequences. Some time ago, I received an email from a radio listener and I'm going to read you a a portion of it, actually three different portions of it. I'm not going to read you the whole thing because it's too long. And it, it was a negative one. I don't often share these because they they very rarely have any value to anyone other than me to see them. Many times they don't have any value to me either. But this one has some value for us today. The letter begins very politely. Pastor Pete, you seem like a nice guy with good intentions. I liked that part. That was the only part I liked. (laughs) They were buttering me up. You seem like a nice guy with good intentions, but after listening to your program for some time now, I feel compelled and called, spiritual words, to write to you and expose the greatest error in your teaching. You preach a narrow gospel. A loving God would never make access to himself so restrictive. He loves us all and he will accept us all and I believe he will allow everyone to enter heaven when their time comes because he, after all, is a God of compassion and love. The letter continues for a few more paragraphs along those same lines with their theological case and verses and references. And then it ends with this line. Stop preaching your narrow view of the gospel. They're right. They're right about the fact that I preach a narrow gospel. <laughs> See, I preach a narrow gospel because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That sounds pretty narrow. <laughs> it's, it's a narrow gospel. I I preach a a narrow gospel because John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. See, it's a, he's the gate. It's the only way. I preach a narrow gospel because Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, there's salvation In no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. 
I preach a narrow gospel because 1 Timothy chapter 2 Verses 5 through 6 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. I preach a narrow gospel because 1 John 5, 11 through 12 says, And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I preach a narrow gospel because Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And few find it. I preach a narrow gospel not because it's the easiest gospel to preach. Not because it's the gospel that makes me the most comfortable. Not because it's the gospel that has the least amount of questions attached to it. Not because, certainly not because it's the most popular gospel. I preach a narrow gospel instead of a prosperity gospel or a humanistic gospel or an all-accepting gospel, not because it's the gospel I would prefer. I preach it because it is the gospel. So, it's the only, we just have two choices. And I'm sorry if you feel like it's narrow, but it's the truth. And can I just tell you, church, you have to make your choice. God has already made his choice. God doesn't leave anything up to you or me other than to make the choice. God's already made his choice. You know what he chose? He chose you. The question is, will you choose him? God made his choice when he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. God made his choice when Jesus was punished for your iniquities. God made his choice that day when the earth shook and the the earth was covered in darkness and the curtain in the temple was split and the sum of the entire sins of the entire world fell upon his one and only son. God made his choice when he crushed his son on the cross and spilled his son's blood, the sinless lamb of God for you and for me. God made his choice when he decided to carve in eternity a path to heaven marked with forgiveness and grace and redemption and love through the blood of Christ for you and I. There's nothing left for you to do except to choose to make your choice. This hour, make your choice, knowing that every choice has a consequence. I implore you to make your choice and to repent and be saved this day, to call on Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you have not, God has chosen you. Will you make the choice to choose him? Let's pray. If you're here today or if you're watching today or listening today and have never called on Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to do it. Not by raising your hand or coming to the front, but by praying to God and repenting of your sins and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. If that's you, just say this with me. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. And I ask today by faith that you would change me from the inside out. In faith, I repent and confess these sins to you, Lord, and acknowledge that only you can cover them. 
Only you can save me. Only you can cleanse me. I thank you for choosing me and giving me this path, making it available. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Father, as we close today, we pray for those who've just given their lives to you. I pray that they would shout it from the rooftops, that they would tell their friends and family, that they would tell those sitting around them before they even get up from their chairs, Lord, because they're so excited about what they have received. Lord, I'm reminded of Proverbs 15.10 as we close today, which says, Discipline is harsh for the one who leaves the path. The one who hates correction will die. I thank you for those who have heard you today and responded with a heart of humbleness and repentance to the only gospel that exists, the one of the Bible. Father, help us to live that out. Help us to daily enter through that narrow gate and walk that narrow path so that we can honor, bless, glorify, and proclaim you wherever we go. We ask and we pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen.